Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to tonight's event, Integrating the Healing Properties of North American Traditional Medicine with Western Practice, a conversation with Dr. Lori Arviso of our class of 1989. 79. 79, oh dear. Start out, start out on the wrong foot. Anyway, greeting. <laughs> Greetings also to our online audience. Uh, I'm Victoria Holt. I'm the director of the John Sloan Dickey Center for Inter International Understanding here at Dartmouth. Um, and we are very committed to upholding our founder's vision. It was Dartmouth President John Sloan Dickey who urged the students of Dartmouth to see the world's problems as their problems, but to also see themselves as part of the solution. And I think tonight's conversation falls very much in that value system and that practicality. So I'm particularly invited, happy to have you here for what we call the Mary and Peter Dahlman 1951 Great Issues Lecture. The Dahlmans were actually quite an inspiring couple. Peter, class of 51, was a distinguished medical researcher and professor, and his area was nutrition, and he was particularly excited that his work had public and civic uh, applications. His wife, Mary, was also equally impressive. She was a giant in the world of endocrinology and one of the first women, women to be a tenured basic science faculty at UCSF. Her field included looking at how feeding and comfort food are important in stress dynamics, hormonal, hormonal response, metabolism, something that we look at today as part of generational trauma in different populations. So in particular, I'm glad that it's their series that also brings our speaker here. And I will say we've been, uh, you come after a few other, I'll just mention briefly, last year we had Ambassador Keith Harper, who is the former U.S. Ambassador Human Rights Council and himself uh, an expert in Native American law and practice. We've had Dr. Adowo Abajide, an expert in climate change, who spoke about what's happening from future cities. And also Ambassador Susan Rice, who today is uh, the former National Security Advisor to Barack Obama and the current Domestic Policy Council Director for President Biden. So thanks again to the Dolmans for their support. So Dr. Alvord, who graduated from the class of Dartmouth of 1979, <laughs> went on, on to a career in medicine and health. And she has said through many interviews earlier that when she grew up, she did not know a Navajo surgeon and had no personal plans to become one. But her subsequent education took her exactly in that path. She went on to Stanford School of Medicine, which led her through a Western system and a successful career as the first female Dindi or Navajo surgeon, Diné or Navajo surgeon. It's a ho one hallmark of her success that Stanford has honored her as being the recipient of the 2018 J.E. Wallace Sterling Lifetime Achievement Award handed out to very few of Stanford's graduates. Her parallel clinical work focuses on how to bring traditional Navajo philosophies and practices of healing to a more Western medical system. Elements of this approach include access, communication, comfort, cultural respect, among many, many other efforts. So what she really brings to us today is experience with a lifelong path of living and learning in multiple worlds and the dedication to bringing the best of both of those to all of us as part of her healthcare leadership her clinical practice, and her engagement with communities such as our own. So we're very grateful to have her here today. Just a brief on process. After the doctor gives her remarks, I'll invite my colleague, uh, Dickey Associate Director Don Carey, up to introduce the panel who will join her. So Dr. Alford, the floor is yours. My name is Lori Arviso Alvord, and I am a member of the Sidnagini clan which is the black streaked wood, or also known as the Ponderosa Pine Clan of the Eastern, Eastern Sacred Mountain of Blanca Peak, which is um, near Alamosa, Colorado, and um, also Ashihidene Clan, which is the salt people, and um, they are one of the earlier clans. Um, I come from Crown Point, New Mexico, which is also the Eastern Navajo Agency um, and it is not exactly on the reservation, but it's in the checkerboard area, which is where the lands come together between the reservation and the Bureau of Land Management and other private land and things of that nature. Um, I feel like I am married to Dartmouth. <laughs> I have left Dartmouth as an undergrad, only to come back later as a uh, associate Dean for Student Affairs 
uh, overseeing student affairs and admissions and uh, diversity at the medical school, uh, only to be divorced by Dartmouth when they let me go in 2009, only to be called back by Dartmouth for their um, baccalaureate address in 2017, and uh, now again here for the Dahlman lecture. And uh, so I think even though we've tried to leave each other, I don't think we're going to be doing that. So, um, and I gave a convocation a long time ago for uh, James Wright uh, at uh, the very beginning, and he got a Navajo rug out of that. So um, <clears throat> that was good for him. Um, I truly am the product of, of Dartmouth, literally. Uh, some of you may recall when President Kimeney started the Native American program, uh, which was Native American programs, Native Americans at Dartmouth, and the Native American Studies um, program, which later became its own department. And he did that with uh, Michael Doris, who was the first chair for uh, Native Studies here, and is an author that some of you know quite well, probably. And uh, if it was not for them, I would not be standing where I am, because that Kimeney recreated or re recommitted Dartmouth to Native education. That was the original charter, and that is what he decided to do. And from that time, he brought many Native students from all over the country, myself being one of them, May being one of them as well, May Houston here. Um, and so, really, if I had not had that start, I don't know that I would be a surgeon and an author. I, I don't know that. Um, and so thank you, Dartmouth, my husband. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to start um, the talk uh, with a reading um, from The Scalpel and the Silver Bear. Um, the Scalpel and the Silver Bear goes lots of places I don't get to go. Um, it's used in quite a few courses and um, has been curriculum for um, Georgia College and State used it for their whole freshman year and Navajo Prep also used it in every course they taught for a year and um, University of New Mexico made everybody read it one year. Unbelievable. So anyway, um, starting with this to take you to a ceremony, it is the night chant and um, it's held in winter, and this is to, um, Diana, I'm having a little trouble moving this PowerPoint over. Can I get, okay. Oh no, that's the one I need. Never mind. Another class of 86. <laughs> <coughs> and a patient, and a patient. She was working on me earlier. I said, I've operated on you, now you operated on me. <laughs> There we go. My job's way easier. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure of that. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I apologize, too, for this talk because I wanted to fine-tune it for this particular uh, audience. Unfortunately, I left my computer home. It was charging right, right by the backpack, but you know. And um, I was able to pull my my chart, my um, uh, presentation off of iCloud, um, but then I couldn't even amend it because the Dickey Center's license for Microsoft Office was not established well in that <laughs> computer I got. So I guess this presentation just wants to be what it is right now. So it's going to be what it is. Um, so let's go then. We're going to um, the night chat for a moment. You know, it's actually a few more moments than this, but here we go. Conroy Chino, Channel 4's news anchor, an Indian from Acaba Pueblo, called for a no-burn night. In Albuquerque, on windless nights, the smoke from the fires gets trapped in the basin of the Rio Grande Valley, and on a no-burn night, no one can warm themselves by fireside. But just a few hours later, deep in Diné Ta, the land of the Diné, the Navajo, I stood amongst five huge pinyon fires burning furiously and stoked with pieces of wood so huge each could be an entire tree trunk. The flame shot into the dark sky and sent up plumes of orange sparks that twirled overhead as if to conspire with a ceiling of bright white stars. A tingling of anticipation and excitement filled the air 
It was a traditional winter ceremony, the last night of the night chant, the Yebache. In the center of the winter night was a hogan surrounded by a cluster of parked pickup trucks. Before the hogan stood a chair and ha- covered with hand- Pendleton and handwoven Navajo blankets. In the chair sat a girl. She was tall, you could tell by the length of her legs in front of her. She was lovely and around her head was tied a red sash. I did not know this young woman, but she was clearly ill. That is why she was sitting wrapped in blankets on this cold night in front of the Hogan. She was here to be cured. On this night, everyone had come together for one reason. Talking God, Haschetli, would dance in the firelight beneath the thick silver belt of the Milky Way to cure this girl. The songs of the night chant tell of the beauty of the Navajo universe. House made of dawn, house made of evening light, house made of dark cloud. Dark cloud is at the house's door. The trail out of it is dark cloud. The jagged lightning stands high upon it. Happily may I walk. Happily with abundant showers may I walk. Happily with abundant plants may I walk. Happily on the trail of pollen may I walk. Happily may I walk. May it be beautiful before me. May it be beautiful behind me. May it be beautiful below me. May it be beautiful above me. May it be beautiful all around me. In beauty, it is finished. Hojona Hosling, Hojona Hosling, Hojona Hosling, Hojona Hosling. The Yebache has to be held on a winter night when the snakes are sleeping and before the thunder comes. It is said that everyone who attends benefits the ceremony from the ceremony's healing power. As I stood in the freezing winter air, a medicine man and another man were conferring about their patient standing on either side of the girl in the chair. A lot of activity was going on inside, but only family members would be allowed to enter that sanctuary tonight. For the past few days, sand paintings had been made at dawn there and destroyed by twilight. Prayer sticks and other sacred objects had been prepared for the ceremony. A woman came out and wrapped another blanket around the girl and placed a basket of corn pollen in her lap. (coughs) From beyond the makeshift parking lot, shapes emerged from the dark emptiness. It was the dancers. At first, there were only three, and they approached slowly. They were nearly naked, wearing only small skirts of wool and moccasins, their bodies painted white with ash. The first was Talking God. His face, he wore a mask of painted buckskin and eagle feathers. He danced toward the girl with a bouncing movement, spruce branches wreathing his neck. Behind him came Water Sprinkler, and then behind him, third and last in the group, a figure completely hunched over like an arthritic old man. It was Yas Kitty, the hunchback, whose wooden cane spoke into three branches at the bottom like a claw. Their feet stamped in unison. They shook rattles in their right hands. Then Hashchetli let loose a series of cries that echoed four times into the cold air, and together they began to chant a song that belonged to the night. The singing was repetitive and rhythmic, causing a rush of memories inside me. It was all in the Lowell vocal register, filled with solemnity and magic. The night chant, like all our ceremonies, is believed to be a gift from the Ye, the ancient holy people, all of whom come to visit the Diné during this ceremony. The girl got up from her chair. She pulled blankets around her tightly. She walked over to the dancers and with a wand-like wave of her arm, sprinkled corn pollen onto each of them. Then she went back and sat in the chair. The dancers shook their rattles in sweeping gestures toward the earth and went back to the place where they had come from. Their brightness closed back into the dark envelope of the mesa. All the people were there to help this girl get well. She must be aware of the power of their collected presence around her, I thought. She could feel, see, and smell this medicine. It was hypnotic, the repetitive chants, the smell, the swirl, the sting of wood smoke the rattles and rhythms of drums, the appearance and disappearance of dancers. In spite of my formal medical training, I knew that being surrounded by one's family and greater community for nine days, seeing dancing holy people smudged with gray ash, bringing healing chants from the dark mesa, would have a great, po- very positive effect on her condition, whatever it might be. Ceremonies are magical and powerful. A spiritual intensity and an energy surrounds 
the healing ceremony that is almost completely absent in Western medicine. Centrally, though, the purpose of the ceremony is to help the patient return to a way of thinking and living in harmony and balance, which helps guide the patient's body back to health. While training at Stanford, I had yearned for something like it there for my non-Indian patients who went through their operations alone or nearly alone. Their minds and their spirits were often not prepared for surgery and could not assist in healing them, nor did their families and communities come together for the purpose of helping them heal. And I wondered if other people whose ancestors had been part of tribes centuries ago yearned for tribal identity. And in the roar of the Yebuche fire beneath the starry sky, I felt how lucky I was to be part of my tribe. And even though the night chant had not been for my own patient, I was glad that I had come. Okay. I apologize, I'm still coughing. Um, I have been coughing for almost a month. Not COVID as far as we know. I went to visit my son who's in family medicine residency in Hawaii. His partner is native Hawaiian and they're gonna live on the big island and raise their kids. And I went snorkeling and I got ocean water in my nose and my throat and I started, came up coughing and I haven't stopped. So the ocean must not have been uh, thrilled to see me or something, maybe. I'm currently working, um, oh my goodness, that's, um, that's even wrong. I apologize. So I'm currently not at Banner Page Hospital. Uh, I am a chief of staff and general surgery at um, Astria Toppenish Hospital. And we are in Eastern Washington, a little south of Yakima, and uh, provide service to the Yakima Nation, Navajo, Navajo not Navajo, Na Yakima Native American Nation, as well as the Yakima Valley Farm Workers. And they are the people who bring food to our tables. They're many undocumented, uh, many without insurance, and um, they struggle for health care, um, which is not right because as I said, they bring our food to us and they should get a better deal than that. Um, again, cruise on by, we lived in Lake Powell, it was awesome. We had a very cool boat and we went on many wonderful trips, but now we don't. <laughs> we actually do still have a boat. We have a 31 foot trimaran. My husband races competitively, has won some national races and um, uh, he would go on and on about it if he was here. But um, it's been, um, it just came out after several years. Uh, it was in storage and we sailed it on the Columbia River and we hope to go to the San Juans Islands soon. This is a slide of one of my ancestors, Jesus Arviso. Jesus is not Navajo. Jesus is uh, Spanish. Jesus had fair skin and blue eyes. Jesus lived in um, northern Mexico and was captured by the Apaches and sold to the Navajo when he was a boy. They say for the price of a small pony. He was raised with the Navajos, initially considered a captive, a, a prisoner of war, sort of. Um, but he became the chief interpreter for the Navajo tribe. You can see him on the far right or left, however you're looking. Um, and he interpreted our treaty with the United States of America. And so um, he learned Navajo, he spoke Spanish, so it was Navajo to Spanish, then Spanish to English translation. And um, he gets to be in this talk because he also served as a translator for Washington Matthews, who um, wrote a book about the night chant many, many years ago, still in publication by the University of Utah. Um, so he is my grandmother's grandfather. And just as a funny little aside, there are many Navajos named Arviso. Everyone I have ever met can trace their lineage back to him. <laughs> he had five, no, four Navajo wives and one Mexican wife. He was quite a guy. However, they were mostly sequential and not all at the same time, I'm told. You know, it's 
kind of hard to keep going in those days, you know, mid 1800s. Mm. All right. <coughs> this is the this is the Navajo Nation, and does my cursor work? Can you see that arrow? Yes. Okay. We are going to go to Chaco Canyon for a moment, and then over to Canyon de Chez, because Canyon de Chez is where the night chant was born. But Chaco is um, the home, one of the homes of the Anasazi. They are the ancient ones, and um, they um, they have some wisdom for us. This is also a picture of our land and, and place geographically, but it has our four sacred mountains, uh, east, north, south, and west. And as I was saying, uh, my clan is from this mountain, the eastern sacred mountain. However, because we live near here, um, my children have both their placentas buried on the very highest part of the southern sacred mountain, Mount Taylor. And uh, so that's their connection. We bury our placentas to be connected to our culture in one way or another. So um, my mother, who is not Navajo, uh, left my placenta in the hospital. So her joke is that that's why I'm a surgeon. <laughs> yes, she's quite clever sometimes. Anyway, um, this is a... We'll come back to her in just a moment because I actually want her in a slightly different place. This is Changing Woman, Asana Yehi, and she is uh, very central to many of our teachings um, and our spirituality. But we're going to go to Chaco for just a second. And uh, this, so this is a historical monument. It's protected by the, what is it, U.S. Forestry Department or whoever, whoever those guys in the khaki suits are. They're over there protecting Chaco. And the reason we're going to Chaco is to talk about ancient wisdom. Because you can see a, a spiral petroglyph there. And um, during the summer solstice, and only on that day, two beams of light come on either side and, and are boundaries for this petroglyph. However, on the summer solstice, one beam of light comes straight through the middle of the spiral petroglyph. Now the Anasazi are thought to have lived here around 900 AD. And so the question here is, how did they do it? How did they do something it re would have required engineering. It would have required an understanding of planetary motion. It would have required the ability to make something so good that it still exists in 2023. How many things do you know that were created in 900 AD that are still functioning in 2023? It's an example, I think, of the fact that um, people, our peoples on the planet, have had wisdoms that go very far back, a very, very long way back. So for the moment, to go back to Changing Woman, um, our ceremonies are, if you have ever studied Navajo ceremonies or even glanced at Navajo ceremonies, our ceremonies are extremely elaborate, extremely elaborate, with um, dozens of, chair, of prayers and chants, with sand paintings, with dancers, with um, many objects that are sacred, that are made. Um, and uh, when you think about it, they are a not, they are, they were, a tribe that uh, did not have a written language. So if you were a tribe that ha did not have a written language, how would you convey information across many generations, information that you think is important? Well, you would embed it in the ceremonies, right? Because the ceremonies are learned and they're remembered and they're taught 
down one after the other. But all of the ceremonies are in the minds. They weren't written down anywhere. They are in the minds of our medicine men, which have to have pretty darn powerful minds, honestly, because um, it's harder than memorizing an anatomy book, really. Um, it's quite difficult. At the center of part of our ceremonies is a changing woman, and she's here uh, to introduce us to the idea of holy beings um, and to the start of a, a bit of a discussion about um, our ceremonies. It's impossible to adequately convey even a tiny slice of, as I said, these very elaborate and complex ceremonies, but it in one setting, but it is possible to talk about a few concepts that are at the core, at the heart, at the middle. And so Changing Woman is thought to have created the people. You can see the little people in the wedding basket um, there from her own skin, from her own DNA. It is said that we carry the holy people within us, their spirit, their energy. The night chant was, was born in Chaco Canyon, and the, I'm sorry, in Canyon de Chez. And uh, this is spider rock. Ooh. And uh, it goes up hundreds of feet into the air. It's really quite fabulous. I know everybody goes to the Grand Ch Canyon, but Canyon de Chez is also very, very beautiful. Um, it also has some Anasazi ruins in it as well. During part of the ceremony, um, sand paintings are made. These are, this is one in particular that is showing um, depictions of the holy people, the Ye, also known as Kachina if you're Pueblo, but we're not Pueblo, nor do we want to be. Anyway, that's a Pueblo joke. Um, you want to hear another Pueblo joke? <laughs> What do you call a three-foot Hopi doll? Life-size. <laughs> okay, they're not very tall. Anyway, um, so these, these are very, very complex paintings, and they are made, um, they come straight from the mind of the painter to the to the hands, and the sand is then, as you can see, released to create these. Um, and you can't mess up, you can't get it wrong. It has to be perfect. So this requires quite a lot of skill. <clears throat> Patient sits on the sand painting during part of the ceremony, and at this time spiritually joins with a holy energy, an energy that is sacred um, with the holy people. Uh, and um, at the conclusion, the ceremony, I mean, the paintings are destroyed. They're very much like the mandalas, the Buddhist mandalas. And there's actually a comparative work uh, between the Tibetan Buddhists and the, the Diné um, by Peter Gold, which uh, shows a lot of similarities. Um, the dancers wear these headdresses, and uh, I wanted to show these to you so you had a better sense of cer the ceremonies in there. This is um, Talking God here, and this is Calling God, if you know these, um, these beings. These are the, the children of Changing Woman, the twin warriors here. And then down here, I would have to say he's my favorite, is Yas Kitty. He's the, the hunchback that I talked about, and he is um, one of the Blue Ram people. And he will come back in the, in the talk at the end um, when we talk about the importance of the natural world um, and its uh, spiritual significance, um, because he plays a very important role in a story that's in the night chat. Um, I need to cough. <coughs> 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 
excuse me. This is a, um, these cannot be photographed, these dances, as you can imagine. Um, but this is a, an artist rendition, um, a Navajo artist rendition of the dancers. And so that's what it looks like when I was talking about the dancers. This is, this is how they are. They're very beautiful. The dances are very beautiful. Um, so now we're going to shift gears and talk about elements of ceremony um, that if viewed through the a Western lens are um, uh, areas where healing can happen. So our tribe interprets illness as being out of harmony or balance in any area of your life. So it can be a mind disturbance or disorder. It can be physical in the body. It can be spiritual. Whole communities can be in and out of balance or whole peoples. Our relationships with the animal world and the environment can also be out of balance. Now, if you took, if you could take one word that is at the very heart of ceremony. It's the word hojo or hojoji. Um, this is a word that's difficult to translate, but it conveys a state of being, I guess is what I would call it. Um, a state of being for an individual, but also a state of being for everything, the whole cosmos. And it encompasses this be way of being that is very peaceful, very balanced, in harmony with everyone around you, with all of your family, with your clan members, with the co whole community, and then with the natural world too, with the earth and the sky, with the animals, with everything. Okay. And we say that um, that life begins with an energy that comes into uh, our being, and it is that energy is in everything, and we are connected to that energy through sacred winds, which are part of our breath. Our breath exchanges with ancient winds, and the winds are carrying the energy of our life and all life. It's kind of a big idea, got to say. But, um, but yeah, a slightly more uh, deeper element is um, what is called Sa'anagai Bekehojo. And um, this is a very, very interesting, interesting I was going to say phrase, but it's really a concept or a, a, a way, I guess. It is literally translated as living through your whole life with spiritual balance and harmony, living in harmony with all around you, um, living in peace, and loosely translated as walking in beauty, but not just the physical beauty that you think of when we say beauty, but more of this way of of living that is not only harm in harmony with everything around you but deeply interconnected and you're aware of that connection and you're feeding those connections and so you're not only caring for yourself your family but you're caring for your extended family for your community for all people on the planet and for the planet itself and the universe um, and because it's inside of, this energy is inside of all of us, we do not feel separate from one another. This kind of is similar to non-dualism in, in Buddhist thought, that we're not separate. And when we're not separate, we don't think of everything as being not me, other, enemy, all those things that, you know, create antagonism and, and competition and um, um, disharmony, okay? Um, so yes, it is a universal force that connects all things and is therefore everything's interconnected. The energy 
is good and pure and beautiful. And um, it is um, connected to a concept called universal mind. I'm just going to say that where um, our consciousnesses are connected to a larger consciousness, consciousness, a larger consciousness, the universe, okay? Um, Sa'anagai, it's about yin and yang. Sa'anagai is male, Bekehojo is female. Sa'anagai is father sky, Bekehojo is mother earth. And there are, throughout all of our ceremonies, there are these dualities of many represented as male, female, not all. And then there are colors and other things going on too. Lots, lots and lots and lots of other things. But, but this is one of the main duos. And so we're going to go over, we're going to talk a little bit about mind, mind and mind healing. We're going to talk about physical wellness, food, and then spiritual or natural world and spirituality. And uh, I'm going to cough again. <coughs> um, we believe that thoughts have great power and meaning and um, that it is possible to think or speak something into existence. And um, so that sounds a little bit like fantasy, um, wh except when you start to think about things like athletes and what they meditate on before they compete. And it is said that when they focus on what they need to focus on to win and they visualize themselves winning, that they're more likely to win. Okay. It's more, um, it, it, whenever you're focusing and thinking about a goal and completing it and seeing yourself complete it, you're more likely to complete that goal. Okay. Um, optimists live longer than um, pessimists. I don't know if you know that, but um, in that side, we always say that we should be focusing on good outcomes for the future. Navajos are some of the original positive thinkers. You would never hear somebody say, um, I hope I don't get into a car accident on my way to work. Because that's almost like inviting it to you, calling it to you. Um, you don't say those kinds of things. And likewise, thinking of negative thoughts and ill thoughts may invite adverse outcomes. So when I was pregnant with Cody, um, the Navajo nurses told me that I needed to be careful what I thought and I needed to be careful about um, what I allowed to come into my mind. So I was not allowed to watch any um, violent movies, uh, no more Steven Seagal, no more Clint Eastwood. That was back then, right? And um, so I did all of that. And they said, whatever comes into you goes into the baby. It's the baby. Protect the baby. You have to be in a sea of tranquility for the baby. So I did all of those things. And uh, I even had um, a ceremony since I, I am not traditional Navajo and I'm only half Navajo. I never was able to have a kennel thaw. And that we'll talk about kennel thaw in a minute. But um, the next best thing was to have a ceremony with me and the baby um, that was um, part of like a, a blessing way. So. Um, so I did those things and then I picked up some literature from the March of Dimes during one of my visits to my OB and it said that during pregnancy women should avoid stress because increased stress during pregnancy has been linked to premature delivery of baby. And I went and I thought about the Navajo nurses and I'm like, you're not supposed to have arguments. You're not supposed to have any kind of disharmony when you're pregnant. And so probably in one way, um, some Navajo midwives many, many, many years ago realized that the women that were not carrying their babies to term were struggling with some of these stress, struggling with disharmony, struggling, you know, 
in some way in their life. So that got me thinking about what Navajos think about and talk about and what the rest of the world is doing with regard to understanding mind states. And um, it took me to a field called psychoneuroimmunology. And that is really just the effect of the mind on the body. Now, you would have thought that somebody would have looked this up a long time ago because, I mean, the, the mind, the brain is part of the body. Why wouldn't the mind affect the body? Wow. <clears throat> Herbert Benson at our comp competing school down south with the crimson color, <laughs> he was down asking the same question, and he asked the question, can the mind influence body states? And he started very simply with vital signs. And he started with blood pressure and heart rate. And what he found were that different mental states, in fact, could influence the blood pressure and heart rate. And when you were very calm and relaxed, that your, your heart rate and your blood pressure were lower. And when you were upset and um, unhappy or angry, that your heart rate and your blood pressure were up, right? Um, that became known as biofeedback. That was the very first start of this discipline. However, this has been studied now um, since from the late 80s, I think, all the way to now. And here were some of the first things that were found that actually stress, psychological stress, impaired our immune system and our antibodies, IgG, IgA, natural killer cells. Distress and depression were associated with two important processes for carcinogenesis, poorer repair of damaged DNA and alterations in apoptosis. For those of you who are not medical, that's programmed cell death. In other words, it messes with cell death so the cells keep replicating, right? So um, they found that stress and depression may increase susceptibility to infection. Certain mental states were associated with immune function and health in some studies, such as how much control people had over their lives and their views of themselves and the future. What helped? Relaxation training, stress management, and support groups. Well, if you remember what I, what I said earlier, that Navajos, Dene, always talk about the future in a good way, in a positive way. Well, here they are talking about, you know, your view of the future has to do with the mind and the body and, and IgG cells and things like that, and support groups. So what is a ceremony but a support group? Maybe some of the original support groups, to be fair. All the people were there to help this girl get well, and she must be aware of the collected power of their presence, I thought. Everyone there was focused on this one person, was sending their energy to her to heal. Okay. So... You, you might think this was just an accident. You might think, well, the Navajos were doing this, but they didn't know what they were doing. They were just doing this. This is a quote from a medicine man from Tuba City, Thomas Atatli. The key to restoring a person to health, whether it is mental or physical, is purifying their thought. That the thought is the foremost energy that we have as a person. A ceremony is done to beautify our thoughts again, and if that can be done, the rest should follow in terms of the physical self. Hojo, the state of being, is this purifying, it's this cleansing, it's removing the negativity, it's defragging our hard drive up here. That's what it is. And it's said to be extremely powerful 
It's also described as glittering. I'm not sure why, but it's glittering in the in the talk. So um, the key to restoring someone to health, the thought, our minds are the foremost energy that we have. Well, um, if I had been able to update my slides, <laughs> I would have added that these studies in mind-body medicine have gone on to show things like um, mind states and meditation can actually um, help with chronic pain. It can help with depression um, and actually even um, changes in um, telomerase, which if you guys know what telomeres are, that's those chromosomes that uh, decide how long we live. Interesting that mind states could be working on those. We'll go over to uh, a few other things in just a moment. Did I miss? Just a second. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, okay. Um, I would have rearranged things too, because I don't, anyway. Um, this is Changing Woman. She, this is the, the clans, the creating of the clans, and every clan comes with its own animal as well, so you can see that um, they're, they're coming away. And um, I just mainly included this because it's such a beautiful picture. It's just so beautiful, and rainbows are always around. Um, all the most beautiful things are there. Um, I'm going to come... Mm, okay. Um, this is a picture of um, a young woman. She's mixing a batter of corn for a corn cake, and she's making a huge corn cake that is baked in the ground for um, a ceremony that celebrates when she comes, when she moves from child to woman, from the puberty ceremony, okay? And um, during this ceremony, um, a lot of things happen, but uh, some of the... Um, some of the more salient things are that she receives a lot of teaching by the women. She is taught how to live. Um, she receives advice, but also during part of it, she lies face down on blankets and her body is massaged by the women. And they tell her that she is going to be beautiful and strong and that she will have long hair What's the business with the hair? Who gives a hair? Who cares about the hair? Well, what's hair made out of? Protein. What does long hair signify? You have a lot of protein. What does it mean if you have a lot of protein? It means you're very healthy. So hair and the strength of hair um, you might want to think of Samson and Delilah too. You know, he, why was he so strong and had all that hair? And anyway, stop with that. Um, but these were the, these are the things that she is told. Her body is molded. Not to say that she will be physically pretty, pretty beautiful. When I say she'll be beautiful, it is hojo beautiful. It is not pretty with clear skin beautiful. Um, this is what she's told. And then during part of this ceremony, um, she, changing woman, merges with her. And she is changing woman for a period of time. She is holy. She is sacred. And she is able to bless anyone that comes, anybody. And they can be healed through her. It's very powerful. And the reason I tell you these things is to make one big point, which is these are the messages that are given to women in this tribe. These messages tell you you are powerful, 
She runs every morning to reach, meet the dawn, and the holy people help her, and no one can catch her. She is strong. Imagine what it was like to come into adulthood with that, with your community sending you forward with those messages. And then imagine, if you want to, Western cultures, you know, emphasis on how you can never be thin enough and how you, you know, all the magazines show women who are 99% of us could never be as pretty as, and, you know, all of, all of that nonsense is, it's, it makes women depressed, it makes them anorexic, it makes them sick, it makes them have bulimia. Um, what if we were telling our women these things? What if we were sending them out with power? Pick power. And of course, we are a matriarchal society, you know, matrilineal and matrilocal. And women own all the property. So there is that. Um, it's a very powerful, though, way of showing that um, what goes into our minds actually does affect our health in many dimensions. In other words, our self image, it matters. For that matter, let's talk about old people and what messages are given to people in Western society when you age. Let's talk about ageism. Let's talk about how women de feel devalued once they pass a certain age. Let's talk about that for a moment. We do need to fix that. In our society, the grandmother is the most powerful of all. She makes the decisions. She decides. She has the experience. And she's treated as such. And imagine heading into old age, and you don't have that. You, you're out in the world, and you are losing your value by the minute. And somebody's going to let you go from your job because you're not young enough looking. You're not. And I don't mean to focus just on women. It's happening to men, too. And men are feeling the same things. It's about how we treat our elders. So if, in fact, um, the mind can affect the body, then anything that comes into the mind can affect the body. So on one side, I have all the ways that things can come into the mind through sight, through sound, through touch, taste, smell, breath. <coughs> and on the other side, I show some of those integrative medicine things, some of those alternative medicine things, some of those things that a mere 20 years ago everybody scoffed at, except those few people who are willing to step off the beaten cat path and maybe go check them out maybe go see what it was all about. And so, you know, as you think about all these things, it's like, why wouldn't all those things help you heal? If it's affecting your mind, and some of these are physically affecting your body too, like massage, even touch, as people, people need to be touched. You're probably aware of a very famous study where babies weren't held, and they died. They died. They needed to be held and touched. But we still need to be held and touched through our whole lives. If we are not being held and touched, then we feel empty. We feel all somehow, as we say in Navajo. We feel all somehow. So, May's laughing because she's heard it so many times. Anyway, um, so these things are all ways that we can... Um, ways that we can influence us. And then, of course, the ceremonies move into almost all of these, these things. Uh, in particular, I want to focus on meditation and guided imagery, I guess. Oh, I don't know. Music therapy, chant, and drum is right there, too. I mean, there, there's a lot of chanting and prayers and drums. And um, for that matter, for those of you who um, have an interest in Chi energy, acupuncture, and all of that. Acupuncture is a vibrational energy. I've had acupuncture treatments 
Wow. Um, I, I was trained to do acupuncture, but I got so busy doing everything else that I didn't keep going. I need to go back. But one time they did this, was having this irregular uterine bleeding, and they did these acupoints, and I could feel energy moving around in my pelvis for three days, and something was thumping like right underneath my, underneath my ab- umbilicus, and I'm just like, oh my God. Um, but if you imagine that chi energy, which is, is very real, acupuncture is very real, the acupuncture points, is affected by vibration, then why wouldn't chant and prayer affect us as human beings if we contain these vibrational meridians, as they say? So meditation, yes, the um, we do meditation. We don't do it as concentration meditation where you sit and you have a, empty your mind and you don't keep thinking. Um, I spent quite a long time in the Upper Valley actually doing quite a lot of Buddhist meditation and Zen. Um, Navajos don't do it quite that way, but they do prayer and chant. And the prayer and chant is very repetitive. And this is what you need to still your mind. So this is also used in many Buddhist, um, Tibetan in particular, practices. Um, the, uh, and also in the Catholic um, disciplines, because what is the rosary? It's the rosary. You're just saying the same prayer over and over and over again. I used to think to myself, what good is that? Why does that help anything at all except bore someone to tears? Until you start looking at it through the lens of mindfulness and meditation, and you realize that this is another way to still the mind. This is another way to get to where meditation goes. Well, where does meditation go? Um, this is kind of what I've what I just said, there are many similarities for us in meditation and mindfulness. Um, And this is what we just talked about too, that chant and prayer are very similar repetition. The drum can hold the mind focused on one sound. Um, We have guided visualizations. If you heard the prayer I gave, it was talking about on the trail of pollen, you know, dark cloud is upon me. These are all guided visualizations to calm the mind. And then we just talked about vibration. Um, So, so what? So what? Well, some very astute investigators, um, Richard Davison and Sarah Lazar started this. They started looking at the brains of longtime meditators and did functional MRI studies, and it was wild because it showed an increase of left frontal lobe activity. That's an area of the brain that increases your focus and your attention, and it gives you feelings of happiness, calm, and well-being. So just sitting there, chanting, is gonna get you that. It's pretty incredible, but true, and the meditation can also increase your immune response to um, influenza, um, increase your antibodies. What does that look like? It looks like that on the scan. The insula is um, circled in green, so that's an area that lights up. The prefrontal cortex is in the red. And you know what else they found? That the cortex was thicker. The brain's Cortex was thicker. I mean, it's one thing to light up part of your brain with meditation. Okay, I can see that. How do we jump to cortex getting thicker, though? And I don't think we know the answer to that. But something that's powerful enough to physically change our brain is something that's worth having a lot more understanding about. So it is entirely the case that not only do um, the medicine man know about the power of the mind? They may not be doing functional MRIs, but they are definitely doing um, 
they, they do understand the power. And I see you, Don. I'm going to go faster. And um, I know, I know it's hard because they're so, it's so dense. Let's talk about physical wellness. And um, I can send anybody the slides that wants in case it's going too quickly. But traditional lifestyles require you to be physically vigorous. You do not get to be a couch potato if you live in traditional society. Why? Because this is pre-industrial, because if you want meat, you have to hunt it. If you want food, you have to grow it or tr make something to trade for it. If you want water, you have to haul it. You do not get the option to not use your body. And as human beings, we, we are designed to use our body. We are designed, if we don't use our bodies, we get sick. We get fat, oh, fat. We get uh, osteoporosis. We get uh, stiff. We get all kinds of bad things. Our muscles don't work well. Physical wellness is essential. It's valued in ceremony. It's built into ceremony, like the running in the kennel da. Um, and food, traditional diets have more vegetables, less meat. Why? Meat was precious. If you killed a deer, that might have to last all winter. You don't know. You don't know. You have to be, you don't get a Big Mac every day. Mm -mm. You had to consume it in small amounts. And there are spiritual connections to healthy food. Um, corn and corn pollen are at the very center of our spirituality. Um, I won't go deeply into that, but I'm going to take you somewhere close. This is a sand painting of Mother Earth and Father Sky. Mother Earth has the crop, the four, four crops, corn, squash, beans, and tobacco. Father Sky has the sun and the moon and the stars and constellations. And these foods are, they are considered sacred, but they're also extremely, in the Western lens, extremely important. Um, a dietitian told me that if you only ate corn, squash, and beans, you would be able to achieve uh, to obtain 97% of human nutrition of what you needed to survive as a human. How do the Navajos know that? Don't know, but they do. Um, and our traditional diets across our tribes are based on grain, veggies, fish, meat, high fiber, berries and nuts are high in antioxidants. So just by going back to what we used to eat, we could reduce healthcare disparities by reducing the harmful health effects of obesity, um, which as you know, is linked to cancer, heart disease, vascular disease, everything else. This is again, I just can't go without putting that up because it's so beautiful. It's another artist's rendition. And then moving to spirit, we say that we are spiritual beings, as I've talked about already, Thankfully, I talked about this at the front, so I don't have to go over this again, that our breath is part of sacred winds. Um, our spirituality strengthens our relationships to each other, but also to the animals and the environment. And so we say that the natural world is sacred, and it's also family. We call the earth our mother. We call the, the sky father. The animals are brother and sister. Well, it happens that if you, um, if you are a culture and you give something a value assignment of family or sacred, that is what you will protect and defend at all costs. At all costs, that would be our environment. <sighs> Can you imagine what it might, might have been like if Western civilization held this viewpoint? We wouldn't be looking at climate change. We wouldn't be looking at global warming. We would just be trying to figure out whether or not we, we need to stop fishing a little bit over here or over there, or whether we need to stop making t-shirts because they're causing too much energy or shoes or any of the other materialistic things that we have far too much of and don't need. This is an artist's rendition of this way of living in harmony and balance with the natural world. And then, this is by Harrison Begay. And then, I'm gonna kind of wind it down with that blue ram. 
So in the night chant, there's a story. A here's the, here's the ram again. Okay, a boy has a dream, and in his dream, rams with blue faces come to him, and they tell him, "Your people are hunting more game than they need, and it is throwing the universe off balance. And if they continue, we will make the game scarce, and there will be a famine and starvation." The boy woke up from his dream. He's pretty excited, as you can imagine. He went to the hunters and he told them this dream, and they laughed at him and they said, "Go back to your dreaming and let us do the hunting." But this this prophecy came true. The game became scarce. They remembered the dream. They remembered the dream so much they built it into the night chant, and they resolved that they would never. Overhunt again. They would never take more than they needed, but not just of game, but of anything, of anything. And this is sustainability theory. This is subsistence living. This is where you live lightly, carefully. You walk lightly on the land. This is so ingrained in our way that the ram is in petroglyphs in the southwest. Along with that spiral petroglyph, imagine that. I wonder what they're doing together. So these are just what I said. You, you, you. We were told, like when we butcher a sheep, you have to use every part of the sheep. That's a deep, deep teaching, and it's not just because. Well, it's it's partly out of respect for the life of the animal that gave his life for us, but it's also that this is our teaching that. That we need to use every single thing if we can before taking, and then you're supposed to help the help those who cannot. Every year we would take、um, deer meat up to the older people in、um, outside Gallup at Church Rock, deer meat because that was the teaching. That's what you do. So what is this? This is a nice story. It's a good story. It's fun. No, these. These teachings demonstrate the application of sound ecologic principles for conservation of natural resources. The maintenance of balance can result in the preservation of a pure habitat for humans to live in, which is essential to human health. This is Glen Canyon on the Colorado River below Page. It is、uh, during dark cloud, a cloud pregnant with rain.、Um, We teach that we should do everything with thought to what will, how it will affect five generations into the future. Some tribes say seven generations, and I'm hopeful that I even get two or three generations to be able to see this.、Um, since I get three more slides, Don, trust me.、Um, just as a nod to the artists in the in the groups, but. Art has a way of also helping the mind become relaxed, energized, may reduce stress, may augment the immune system, and art is used throughout our ceremonies simultaneously in multiple layers、um, through the dance, the music, the poetry, the drumming, the sand paintings, and our sacred objects, and the calling in the beauty of the nature. But not only can you know can we. Find this art to be beautiful, but the natural world and the environment. As much as we need to protect us, we need it too to heal us. The animals are able to give us great comfort, and they have powerful ways to relate to us. The natural environment can be very calming, and sunlight, forests, beaches, oceans. All of this is a way that we can also reduce anxiety and stress. And then I will end with. Um, Shiprock, which、um, I always end with Shiprock, and Dark Cloud, pregnant with rain, which is so precious in the Southwest. And thank you so much for your time, and、um, we'll keep going. Dr. Alvaro, thank you so much. This was.、Uh, A great introduction to what I hope will be a broader conversation. I'd like to invite、uh, two co. Chatters, as it were, to kick off the conversation here, our co-conversants.、Uh, if you would like to join us in the chairs up here, we have two、uh, members of the class of 
well, one member of the class of 86, but two members of the Dartmouth community. One is May Drake Houston, 86, a, uh, Assistant Director of the Native American Program, and Sean O'Leary, Director of the Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement at the Geisel School of Medicine. Uh, I hope you can kick off with some of the elements that she's brought up here. Uh, and then we'll turn it over to our audience. I am thoughtful of the fact that the visual will start at six, so I <coughs> want to be uh, thoughtful of our time. The visual? There's a vigil going on for some of the yes. national okay. situations. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thank you. It's very good to see you again. It's been a long time. We go way back, uh, working together for um, quite a while in the medical school, and um, miss you. Miss you. <laughs> yeah. Um, you touched a lot on uh, Navajo ways of healing. Um, combining that with your you as a surgeon. Um, how do you best incorporate some of those practices into your into your practice? Um, I can imagine that being maybe not a natural fit, but maybe for you it is. I'm not sure, <laughs> but uh, just curious and wanting to hear more about um, how you're taking these these concepts and incorporating them as a, as an actual surgeon in Western medicine. Sure, thank you. Um, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I have the mic. <laughs> uh, so. The mind state of the patient is really important. The patient's mind has to be calm and relaxed and trust me and trust our team. They have to be ready for surgery before they go in. They can't be upset or angry or frightened even, hopefully, because we try to make sure that they are in the best place in their minds that they can be. Um, and then what happens in the OR matters too. So it, it, some of you have read the book, but not all, but I try to prepare myself in my mind before I go into the OR. I, um, I mentally have a meditation specifically for that. And, um, and I treat the patient's body as sacred. That the patient, I, it, it's, I'm a guest there. I, I am invited, but I, I am not in control. I, I'm invited to come. I have to treat their body gently and carefully and respectfully because um, that is our ways of thinking about how we do what we do is to be done in a way that is hojo, you know, and um, that um, likewise, how our relations inside the OR between the anesthesia and our the whole team, our nurses, our assistants, people like that. It has to be harmonious too. And that's what we, it's expected in our OR that people uh, work closely and smoothly together, that we respect one another, that we reteach, uh, that, that we work as a team. Anyone can say anything they're worried about. It isn't a top down by any means. So it is definitely a counterbalance to the historical if you will, patriarchal, authoritarian, uh, surgical history. Um, that's changing quite a bit with women. Um, I actually gave a talk recently uh, last year at uh, for UC Davis's surgical program, and um, specifically because particularly the women in the program said their, their training program was toxic, that they were being treated badly, misused, abused, um, and basically um, they, were, they were very upset and unhappy and they, they knew there had to be a different way to train and a different way to practice, and there is. Thank you, Lori. Um, <clears throat> first, an, a quick explanation. Um, Lori, I know Lori's clans because obviously she just gave them. Um, I know that whatever relationship I am to her will be through her father. So that determines our relationship already. So she's going to be um, through my father. My father is also of the Salt clan. 
and her grandfather's father is of the Salt clan. So we are related um, through clan. And so she is my Nolly and I am her Nolly. So it's a convenient uh, descriptor because um, she is a few years older than I am. Uh, she becomes the female grandmother to me and I become the female grandchild to her. So even if I was a month younger than her, I would still be the grandchild. So this is the familiarity that is created by our clan system. <coughs> and I know she talked about it in one of the chapters in her book about how um, she establishes that intimacy with her patients um, so that they can create that comfort that she would like um, moving forward. Does anybody have any questions right now? Um, as a doctor, Mana uh, Tim Barbara. Um, Greetings, I'm a, a Kumandi uh, indigenous woman from Siberia and thank you so much for uh, giving this talk even though I read the book, um, I still learned a lot of new things. And uh, my question is, um, you touch a little bit in the book and of course book was written way before COVID, but um, I'm just wondering how you uh, processed uh, COVID through that system of knowledge and uh, how did you explain it to your patients uh, because you're still in the native health system, right? So, thank you. Um, before I do that, um, I thank you so very much for saying that. <laughs> Because I, I would like to acknowledge somebody in the in the audience, um, Tony um, Ching Tony Hober Hober, um, and and there's a reason. Um, when COVID came, as you may or may not remember, there was a big shortage of um, masks and a shortage of cleaner hand cleaners and on Navajo and. Um, Tony is a member of gospel choir, and so was my daughter. I'm a parent 20. So our Viso Alvord, also known as V, who's, if you, V, V was, anyway, V, V was their own presence on campus, but, uh, um, did a lot with, with many Rockapellas. Uh, she was with Alpha Theta and, um, gospel choir and, um, a couple of other groups. And she was a semifinalist twice for Dartmouth Idol. Well, Tony heard about our problem, right? And she mobilized the, the Upper Valley mask makers. And these women made masks for the Navajo, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of masks for our chapter the, in Crown Point and the chapters around and um, sent them down and um, you can answer back, but I think that it was um, it was a sense of uh, profound gratitude on our part, as well as I think a sense of feel feeling a need that that you all were able to do that that met that filled your heart too. If I can just say something about that, that people do um, when I ask the mask makers to. If they would be willing. Um, the concept of the prevailing mass makers was only by donations were we going to give masks, but it was for the Upper Valley. And I asked if, if they would be comfortable with my request to send to the uh, Navajo and people poured in. So in the end, it was 2,000 masks that people gave me to send. And if it's so um, the reason it's important in what you're saying is that it brought community to all of us. Right. At a time we were in isolation. Right. Sitting in our machines sewing away. 
but we got connected. So it wasn't just that we sent gifts to the Navajo. It came back to us Mm -hmm. in many ways as that sense of non-isolation and understanding what we had and what we needed and what other people needed. And it was a circle of warmth and love that I just don't know if we can ever, but it's an amazing thing to have. Um, It would be hard to duplicate such a beautiful thing, but we should be doing that. Mm -hmm. Right. And, And that effort, because we're all connected on social media, right? That effort, um, my my sister, uh, Karen, was sort of at the center of a hub that had many other groups making masks, too, because they heard of this. And they started helping, too. And then one group got a whole truck and brought down all kinds of of things that were needed, the cleansers and the, the, hand, um, the hand cleansers and things like that. And uh, so it really was this amazing force. You asked the question about COVID, how was it thought of by Navajos? I would call it probably a disharmony. It's a disharmony in the universe. For whatever reason, this, this, this COVID came and it, it caused illness. But I can tell you something about our tribe. Our tribe had, I think, the highest vaccination rate of any group. We were way up in the nineties, very early. We also had, um, Basically, what was that called where they didn't let people move around? It was, um, we, it was lockdown. Yeah, it was lockdown and quarantine. We, yeah. people were not allowed to be out and about moving around. You people complain about ma- wearing masks out in America. Navajo, that's what they were doing. And we did lose a lot of people still, but we probably would have lost quite a few more uh, if, if our leaders hadn't done that. And it was hard. It was very, very hard for the people to be in lockdown. But they understood and they didn't fight about it. And they didn't complain either. And I think the tribe did a really good job of um, using the thought that we have to protect our elders. And that was very well used. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Any questions? We're getting to the end here. Okay, one one more here. <laughs> so sorry. I, my talk was too long. I'm sorry. Your talk was definitely not too long, and I think we would all happily stay for a lot longer because there's so much wisdom to soak in. Um, my name is Sarah Crockett. I'm a teacher at the medical school, and uh, my area of focus is really on um, planetary health, so our connection, how our health and the health of the planet are connected, a lot of work in health and climate change. And I also uh, specialize in wilderness medicine, and I really like to use the phrase wilderness as medicine as my area of focus. Yes. And the more I do research, much like you, the more I find that the concepts that I feel really be most impactful are deeply connected to indigenous ways of thinking. Mm. And I'm really trying to wrap my mind around this concept that keeps coming up in my medical education work of indigenizing pedagogy, indigenizing how we teach. Um, And yet, you know, as someone who's coming from Western mindset and Western training, I'm, my question is, how do we do that? So here we have our indigenous leaders sharing your wisdom, but how do we go about indigenizing our classrooms, indigenizing how we teach medicine so we can find this balance, this planetary health? Um, and that's my question for you. Well, we start working together and we put our minds together and we, you know, sometimes the universe is nods favorably toward us and opens up a way. Um, I can't see the way myself just yet, except that to, to say that I was invited here for this um, really prestigious lecture with following someone like Susan Rice. And that means that the world is changing too, that, that there's a willingness and a readiness to hear what I, the, what, would I bring the knowledge of my tribe? And, and I don't think that that uh, would have been, that there would have been a readiness until the, the time came for that, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Okay, one more quick question. 
as maybe a statement. Uh, I see so many young faces here, and I want you to know uh, that if you follow these directions, first of all, I talked to this lady when I came in, I said, I don't know why I'm here. I know exactly why I'm here. I, you know, this is up my alley sort of thing. I am um, almost 90 years old. Congratulations. And it's that sort of thinking and that sort of background that will help you all the way into your 90s and hike, <laughs> still hiking and skiing and what have you. Yeah. Uh, and a very interesting thing is when I was pregnant, um, I was a dowser at the time. And so I had a little bit of that sort of stuff in, in me. But I was praying that I would have an enlightened child. And lo and behold, she's a big psychic out in California, mm -hmm. earning her living that way. She doesn't talk to me, you know, because mother is dirt sort of thing. But uh, my prayers were answered. And she, you know, she's doing her thing. And she's doing what you people are doing. It's, uh, I've been around your, your reservations. And I just want, felt I needed to tell you, get with it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank oh. you for that. I One more that. piece of thing that I forgot to put in my talk is that the thing in the food section, um, Native people did not eat three times a day. No way, no how did people eat three times a day, traditionally. And um, I've been doing intermittent fasting um, now for about two years, lost 24 pounds. Um, it works, and I feel better, and we don't need to eat three times a day. That's what I want to say. Thank you so much for joining us for this and starting off this conversation. I hope this conversation continues in corners and areas around the campus and elsewhere. Uh, if nothing else, medicine is the best team sport ever invented. So I'm glad you're bringing those elements to it. And thank you. And thank you to our co-conversants here for getting our conversation going. Thank you again. Thank you.